when you hear the word uh, religion uh, or religious, what comes to mind? Religion, uh, religious. Perhaps some, some when they hear that word, uh, the religious, they think of those people uh, who, in the words of H.L. Mencken, uh, quote, have a haunting fear that someone somewhere might be happy. Uh, religion, religious, uh, can be terms for many that have a, a negative connotation. Maybe it's, it's people who are narrow-minded, simple-minded, uh, they're unhappy, they're strict, they're law-based. Maybe you've heard it said, Christianity is not a religion, it is a relationship. Maybe you've said that. I think I've said it in times past. Is that, is that true? I saw a bumper sticker. It said, say no to religion, yes to Jesus. Well, we're in the book of James. It's a letter of five chapters. We've come to the end of chapter one, an important hinge in, in the whole book, really, just two verses that we'll consider. And not only does James, the author, use the language of religion and religious, really a term that simply means the external expression of one's worship and devotion. But James will say that one cannot have an acceptable worship apart from a religion that is pure. He is after a pure religion in the lives of his hearers. Um, he's going to teach us what it looks like, or at least give us a snapshot of what is pure religion. And central for the Christian is to know where, where to possess this. Uh, whose life, whose character are we reflect in pursuing uh, such a pure religion? So it's just two verses, James 1, 26 and 27. Listen to God's word. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart... This person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. One of the great dangers in studying and spending a good amount of time in a book like James, a book that we know already highly stresses the necessity of your works and your actions, a, an externally a, a godly, a holy life. James, we've already seen, stress this when he said, be doers of the word, not only hearers of the word. Later in chapter 2, verse 14, he'll say, what good is it, brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, the danger is that of what we might call moralism. Moralism is a danger still today, to be sure. This is the notion that what matters most, what really matters, is merely one's outward behavior and actions. This is, this is a cultural idea that can creep into the church that that really what makes a person acceptable in society or acceptable religiously is that really that their good outweighs their bad. Whatever standard that they're using, and, and it seems that the world will use whatever standard they need to to ensure that the good will outweigh the bad. That's how it seems to me. What distinguishes the Christian faith and Christian life in which James drives home is that a person's life and actions and behavior, what makes them godly, acceptable, good, is actually something not seen. Even though what he stresses much through this letter is religion, external behavior, it's something not seen. It's that they possess a heart, a desire to reflect the heart of their Heavenly Father. The distinction is not between the religious and the irreligious. It's those who have a pure religion versus those whose religion is worthless. And part of the connecting tissue, part of what holds all of chapter 1 uh, uh, together, is, is the language of Father. The true believer is reflecting their heavenly Father. That title, Father, you may have noticed, is in our passage. 
And it's really a thread that holds the first chapter uh, together. Religion, he says, that is pure and undefiled before God the Father. Reflect on that. Why doesn't James just use the title God? Just to identify the Lord as, as, as God. Why insert or include the Father? Is this just simply the language that, that James is choosing to use to identify uh, our, our God? I don't think so. I think there's more. Uh, he has once before used this title in verse 17. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Likely referring to God's work in creation. He is a good, benevolent, a gracious God in his creation and certainly in his redemption. It seems James is using the language of the Father because he's not only wanting us to see ourselves as children of this Father, sons and daughters, but to reflect in our lives the Father's character. James has already identified two ways in which we have, we might call it a dynamic touch or connection with this Father through chapter 1. One, this Father, this God, shares with his children his wisdom and gifts. Verse 5 and 17, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously. This is the nature of this God that we follow and worship. He he gives generously. And then he says, every good gift comes from the Father. So he's he's a a giver to his children. And two, we share in his nature. Not that we are divine or become divine, but we share in the very life of this God. Remember what he said. He brought us forth by the word of truth. He's birthed us as his spiritual Children, adopted children, through his word spoken to us so that we share with him and in him. And in verse 26 and 27, it's the character of the father that we're called to reflect that James is driving home. The three characteristics in verse 26 and 27, a bridled tongue, the use of of the word in our lives, a caring ministry, a heart uh, for others, identified here specifically, orphans and widows, and three, a life unstained by the world, or a holy, a pure life. All three of those have already been mentioned about the Father himself or the work that the Father seeks to do in us, already in this first chapter. So, number one, it's his word As I've mentioned, verse 18, it's his word that birthed us into new life. It is his word that gives wisdom. As a God whose word is good and life-giving, we're to be a people whose tongue or word gives life. Two, the caring ministry of the Lord through chapter 1, giving wisdom, deciding in his own mind to grant us grace. Notice the language of verse 18. Of his own will, of his own decision, he decided to grant us grace and to birth us. His word to be heard, received, obeyed. His purpose, remember verse 4, to mature us. All All of that is his mercy and care for his own children. That is to be reflected in our care for those in need, examples of which, or specifically orphans and widows that he picks up on or highlights. And three, God's own holiness and his aim to complete you, to make us whole, as he said in verse 4, that we would be perfect or complete. That's to be reflected in our own pursuit of holiness. So all of this is to be a reflection of our Heavenly Father, That's what's coming out in verse 26 and 27. So these verses are essentially saying, like father, like son. Like father, like child. Uh, We all know just how potentially powerful is the influence a father or mother or guardian has on their child. We've all been influenced, shaped, and affected by the godliness or the sinfulness, or both, from our mother, father, or guardian. 
Some children will, will live for years struggling to get out of a huge shadow cast by their parent or parents. In an article in the BBC entitled, The Kids Who Live in Their Parents' Shadows, the son of the famous actor Tom Hanks, his son Colin Hanks, said this, I struggled for years to be my own person. Willow Smith, daughter of actors and singers Will and Jada Smith, described her years as a youth as, quote, absolutely excruciatingly terrible. Of course, it's not just the children of the rich and famous who can struggle or experience confusion or feel the weight of this dark shadow that's cast over them by a father or mother or guardian. Abuse, neglect, unhealthy expectations, a completely absent father. One, one author uh, uh, defined this, this present generation as, as a, f- a fatherless generation or an angry mother. Um, the words of, of First Second Kings came to mind in thinking about God as, as, as father and uh, children to father, thinking of the kings that would rise to the throne. Abijam began to reign, Nadab, Basha, Ahab, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father before him. Even we who have been raised by godly parents or who are seeking to raise our children in a godly way must look upward and point our children upward to God, our Heavenly Father, to see His character. That we would grow and continue to grow into the kind of people God would have us to be. Two brief pictures come to mind. One just this past week while I was bicycling. I was approaching Crystal Lake in Ellington, I think it's in Ellington, and uh, as I began to ride by just one quarter corner of the lake, a young boy, probably six or seven years years old, had just pulled up his fishing rod, and he had a nice fish. I mean, I just caught it, and leaning over him or, or, or behind him was either a father or grandfather, also had his hands on the rod, kind of helping him hold this. I mean, it wasn't this big or anything, but And I just caught him. I mean, the boy's face, huge smile. I don't know if it was his first fish, but I imagine in my mind, you know, this father figure or grandfather teaching him, right, the ins ins and outs of fishing, where you fish, what what kind of rod to use and lure, right? And, And it's all amounted to this catch. Second picture, reflecting on this concept of father, visiting my grandfather in Indiana. He was probably in his 80s. I was probably six or seven at the time. And it was just a simple uh, run to the grocery store. And we got out of the car, and it was just he and I, and we're walking in, and he took my hand. I can still remember. He took my hand and just said, I'm going to show you what grandpa gets at the market. Right? Very simple. I mention these simple pictures because James, in calling us to have a bridled tongue, a caring ministry, and a holy life, is not pointing us to a God who comes at us as a heavy-handed lawgiver with burdensome commands. He is pointing us through all of chapter 1 to a gracious Father. This is the giver of good gifts, of wisdom, of life, This is one who takes our hand, who walks with us. And key is that he is the one who demonstrates the very character he's seeking to work in us. This is the God we worship and serve. His character. Isaiah 41, 3. 41, 13. For I, the Lord your God, Hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. I think this is is the avenue or the perspective that James is coming with in in seeking to encourage these characteristics in the lives of his hearers. So the power of our words is the first thing he mentions. Like the Lord 
whose word brought us forth, who spoke in the beginning, and that which was not came into existence. Let there be light, and there was light. Our words also have power. When we speak, when we, when we do not speak, how we speak. Proverbs 18, 20 and 21. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He's satisfied by the yield of his lips. Not only does good and godly speech and, and restraint bring good to others, but it satisfies one's own life and heart. Verse 21 of Proverbs 18. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. But notice what James says about the tongue. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. So he's not calling for a silent mouth, and he's not calling for a loud mouth, that's for sure. A bridled tongue. It's a vivid picture. Listen to these words. Our tongues possess in themselves all the untamed vigor of a wild beast. And left to themselves, all their savage instincts will be given full play. They need, like horses, to be broken in and harnessed. A bridled tongue. James will go into more uh, description or detail in chapter 3 about how we put bits in the mouths of horses to help control and guide them. So we are to control our bodies and our, our tongue. But the language, the image here, reveals that the tongue is only an instrument. It's not the engine itself. It's an instrument. There's something behind the tongue controlling, directing, moving it. And this is what we learn from our Savior in Matthew 15. Out of the heart comes evil thoughts, slander, false witness. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. So when the couple, perhaps married couple, says we have a, a communication problem, they're, they're at each other regularly, cutting each other off, hurting each other with words, or, or the silent treatment, it's probably not a communication problem. It's a desire problem. It's a heart problem. You may or may not recall on Palm Sunday when the children came forward uh, and I addressed them, and gave them some words and instruction, I told them that I was raised in a family that had a lot of, of different animals. And among them, we had two horses. And I can still remember as a young boy riding on the back of the larger horse, my brother uh, at, at the reins in front of me, and we got bucked off that horse. Right? And just realizing how much power that animal has. I think it might have been the last time I ever rode, at least a horse. It went to motorcycles from that point forward. Engines don't buck. They have other problems. But our tongues and our hearts, like horses, need to be broken in and harnessed. How is this done? The First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution came to my mind. Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion or abridging the freedom of speech. This liberty to express a conviction, a belief. Some would argue and have argued it's the most important liberty we have. And as valuable as it is, our Lord gives an even higher principle, a much higher principle for our tongue. A necessary one for flourishing in relationship and in society. The amendment protects expression, but in no way ensures right use of the tongue. No, the higher principle is found as we follow our precious Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, in and through the Gospels, for example, to see how He speaks, how He speaks forth truth with courage in the face of pressure. When He offers words of hope and He moves 
toward the marginalized, toward those whom no one else will move toward and offer words of hope. Or when he's silent, choosing to be silent, suffering for the sake of others, humble and serving a greater end. We grow and learn to use one of our greatest ministries, the ministry of the word, the ministry of the tongue, as we follow after Christ. He's the word. He's the word of life. I think this is one of the the neglected aspects of ministry life in, in, in the body of Christ. The ministry of word. When you hear the language of the ministry of the word, we might think immediately the pulpit ministry. But the scriptures teach that the ministry of the word goes well beyond the pulpit. It's, it's why Paul will say things like in Thessalonians, after addressing his, congr- his hearers about the resurrection, he'll say, now encourage one another with these words. This is one of the most powerful ministries we have as the people of God, the ministry of the word. The word here, but then our exhortation and encouragement toward one another. The ministry of the word, so precious, so powerful for us that God has given to us. So a bridled tongue. James commits verse 26 to that one characteristic, but there's two more. They share verse 27, but they're not any less significant. With the tongue, James has really moved us inward. Notice he connected it to the heart. But now he kind of moves us upward to see, do we truly belong to this Heavenly Father? There in verse 27. Religion, he says, that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Have you ever been on the giving or receiving end of someone's kindness, sort of generosity, It's happened on a few occasions for Shelly and I while we have been out uh, to dinner. And someone there in the restaurant must have seen us, knew we were there, and when it came time to pay the bill, the bill was paid. It's kind of nice. That's generous. That's generous. I don't know if I would turn that away even if I could. But while it's generous, it's not so much what James has in mind here. James is not after a sort of uh, these random acts of kindness. We might use that language. Our our culture might use that language, try and encourage random acts of kindness. Wonderful. But that's not what James is after here. It's not random acts of kindness. It's more specific. It's more particular. To reveal the heart of our Father, the heart we are to have, in order to be his. Orphans, widows. Uh, two passages to sort of tuck away. One is Psalm 68, 5. Referring to our Lord. He is the father of the fatherless and protector of widows. He is God in his holy habitation. In Deuteronomy 10, as the Lord, through Moses, is preparing his people to enter the promised land, reminding them the character of God and their calling and the kind of character they are to have. And now, Israel, what does the Lord require of you? To fear him, to walk in his ways, to love and serve the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow. He loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love them then. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. James highlights particular groups of people, orphans and widows, though I think we can extend or expand it to consider other groups or individuals with significant needs. But he's emphasizing these because in his day and culture, and still ours in similar ways, they they were often those in a helpless state. And they could not repay 
for the help that they received. So it's, kind, it's, it's showing a kind of uh, cross-centered care, a selfless love, and to those who could not repay, those with uh, significant need. Do, do I live with this aim in my life after the Lord? Attentive to people who have real need, who need others to come alongside, to minister, to help in various ways. If I'm going to have a life that demonstrates real care for those in need, it's going to be the result, it should be the result of first seeing myself as one who is in need, who was in need and who is in need. One who has known the care and the mercy of of Christ. It's, It's not demonstrating mercy for mercy's sake. It is a response to Christ's mercy. That's what makes our Christian compassion certainly distinctive. It's a response to His work in my own life, having tasted of His grace and mercy. A bridled tongue, a caring ministry, and then a holy life is the last thing. These three, by the way, form for James a kind of outline for the rest of the book. These are the three main themes he's going to stress. The tongue, our words, a holy life, a caring ministry. Pure religion is keeping oneself unstained from the world. This is the pursuit after holiness. It's not a sinless life. But it's Christ-centered. It's God-saturated, spirit-empowered. The meaning for world there, unstained by the world, is the same that Paul has in mind in Romans 12 too. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Or in 1 John 2, do not love the world. It's what they have in mind. It's really the whole human scheme organized around human wisdom to seek a human goal with no reference to God, His Word, His Kingdom, His judgments. It's anything, everything at odds with the Lordship of Jesus. Unstained by the world, a holy life, calls for then a total commitment and loyalty to our Lord. And I think it presses the question, are we truly His? James comes at the the life of faith differently than, let's say, Paul in Galatians. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. James comes at another angle. What does your life look like? Are we truly his? Am I his child? Not by virtue of a decision I made in in the past, but in the day-to-day, season by season, at times pressures of this world and conflict within our own hearts? Does my day-to-day life, words and motivations, care for others, relationships, holiness, reflect someone who's living intentionally after the Lord? If life were mainly large decisions to be made, few of us would likely go very far wrong. But faced with the constant pressure of the world's bombardment, sort of insidious bombardment, demands, shouts, its pursuit after your ears and your eyes and your minds, its clamoring for your time, your money, your energy, it's too easy to avoid sort of the huge open pitfalls of sin, but not live a life that is discernibly different from the style of life of most in the world. James's words not only provide a bridge to the rest of the letter, but I think his words really cause, should cause a person to reflect. Perhaps of greatest importance is to remember, James surfaces these characteristics not as a burden to us, but as traits of our Heavenly Father. God's commands are not burdensome. The Apostle John tells us his commands are not burdensome. If they are, we need to look again and more clearly at the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's by his cross 
which is reflected in the meal that we will partake of, that my burden, the burden of sin, the burden of a separation from God, the burden of, of seeking to merit the favor of the Lord, it's there at the cross. The burden is lifted. The gospel lifts that burden so that now these characteristics can be seen as a joy, a blessing. As we walk after our Heavenly Father, who takes us by the hand, who's maturing and growing us in the likeness of, of the true Son, uh, the Son of God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we desire to walk in your ways, to reflect your, your heart and your character, to see these traits, these characteristics worked out in our own lives, a, a bridled tongue, a, a heart and life that de- demonstrates mercy, that sees people in need and, and moves toward them, and a life unstained by the world, a life that is set apart, in which we are pursuing uh, you, each new morning, each new day, walking with you as you take our hand, that hand that has redeemed us, that hand that guides, that comforts, sustains, that hand that guides us to your word to remind us of all that we have through our life in you, uh, in Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that, um, that your Holy Spirit would would work these things out in us. That they would not be burdensome, but helpful and life-giving. A way to live our lives. That we would walk in the steps of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Continue to feed and nourish us, Lord, from your table. and All that it means for us. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.